happy Martin Luther King Jr. weekend and welcome to Bethlehem United Methodist Church. If you're visiting with us either in person or online, we especially want to welcome you. Thank you for joining us. Um, if, if you're watching live online and you have celebrations or, or concerns that you'd like for us to share, just message us and Cade will read those a little bit later in the service. We're continuing our Fresh Start series, which we started last week with our Wesleyan Covenant Renewal Service. The, um, the church began with and in worship, and that's what we'll be doing this next hour as Daniel leads us with a beautiful song of worship. Please stand and join us for this first opening hymn, Build My Life. It's good to see everyone here this morning. The day before Snowmageddon, hopefully you all have your milk and bread so you can have your, I don't know, milk sandwiches. Is that what we do? It's good to be here in community since we'll all be locked up in our homes for the next few days. Let's enjoy this community worship together. Sing with us. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever bring, we live for you, we live for you, holy sound.
builds a firm foundation and I will put my trust in you alone and I will not be shaken and I will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation and I will put my trust in you alone and I will not be shaken holy there is no one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me amen This past week in my newsletter article, I wrote about a young man named Jim Elliott who was killed while serving as a missionary in Ecuador in 1956. And his wife later published a journal uh, which, which included some of his writings and the famous, now famous quote, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. So it's time now to receive our offerings. But before our um, ushers come, I've been asked for an update on our Christmas Eve offering for tornado, uh, tornado response. So far, combined with, with, with the Christmas Eve offerings and, and offerings that have come following that, we're right at, I think it's $1,888. $1, we're still, we're still accepting donations to, um, to alleviate that, and our endowment committee also uh, has donated $5,000. So thank you for your faithfulness and your generosity. If our ushers are ready, we'll receive our regular offering. Will you pray with me? Loving God, you have given us everything. You've given us, you have given us your son. You've given us young people like Jim Elliott who have died while serving you. Help us in our own way to learn to sacrifice and to invest in your kingdom that others might discover who you are. For we pray these things through Christ our Lord. Amen. times I fail still your mercy remain shoot a symbol again still I'm caught in your grace everlasting your light will shine when all else fades never ending your glory goes beyond all pain I 
Bless the Lord of my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy We've come to a time to offer our joys and concerns and our God sightings in this past week. I just want to lift up, we had a great um, full church council meeting yesterday, full house, and lots of great discussion and good news about the future here at Bethlehem. Any joys or concerns or places that you saw God at work in this past week? wanted to mention that we, with Allison's guidance we had a really great youth session this morning it was huge and discussive and like it was awesome so thank you Allison great work I it was part of the day <laughs> I just wanted to ask everyone to please pray for my sister Daria um, She's dealing with some health issues, and we'll find out Wednesday. And then Pete, my um, son and his fam, son Michael and his family, and your prayers. And then he turns forty on Wednesday, another forty-year-old. Yeah. Got some prayers for him. I just want to lift up those who are 
without shelter um, in our communities and our cities as we um, enter into a week of cold temperatures to that they may find um, warming shelters and places of comfort. Any others? Let us pray. Gracious God, you have created us and love us. You invite us to live together in community. We acknowledge our slowness to do good and our willingness to so often leave injustice unchallenged. We thank you for the life of Martin Luther King Jr. and for all your children who have been filled with your vision for life and have worked to bring your vision into reality. Empower us to join them on the journey of faith. We thank you for the people of this congregation and the promise of a new year. Guide us to live by your vision of compassion and justice and love for all people. Move us to bold action. Give us the courage to give ourselves away that others would know you. We pray for those who are unable to be here, for our college students as they make their way back to classes, for those who are sick, those who are lonely, those who are cold, and those especially who could use a special touch from you. We pray for the joys and concerns that have been shared here together and for others we lift in our hearts silently before you now. Most of all, Lord, we thank you for Jesus who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. children's the children's message we've had a lot of reports of sick children so i don't know if we'll have children's message or a prayer for them but but april's coming to let us know <laughs> good morning <laughs> i'll scoot over here <laughs> This morning, Vaughn brought me this picture. Do you see it? It's a Christmas tree. It still has all of its decorations on it. And I wondered if she had kind of looked in the window at my house because until yesterday, I still had ornaments on my Christmas tree. But at Christmas, I'm, I'm putting my Christmas tree away today because it's, Christmas is over, right? And at Christmas time, we celebrated the birth of Jesus. There were shepherds and angels who came and celebrated, and even wise people celebrated the birth of Jesus, baby Jesus. But what does that mean after Christmas? What do you think that means after Christmas? We were talking about the names of Jesus at Sunday school, and one of the names of Jesus was Emmanuel. Emmanuel, God is with us, God is here, and um, a lot of times we read in our Bible, God was with Adam and Eve, God was with Abraham and Sarah, God was with Moses and David and Esther and Gideon, but God is with us now, God is here with us in the birth of Jesus. So how many of you were born a baby you have baby? Oh, yes. And did you stay a baby? No. Did Jesus stay a baby? No. What did he do? He grew up. He toddled about. Do you think he ever fell and skinned his knee? Do you think he lost his teeth like you just lost a tooth? Yeah, he did. Because he grew up just like we grow up. He was a teenager. He was a man. And he lived his life and gave his life as a sacrifice to serve others. And with Jesus' sacrifice for us, we got an invitation from God. I am with you. Will you be with me? Will you come and be part of my family? And we really are part of a very, very old story of God's love and faithfulness 
a story that keeps on going because we are invited to be friends with Jesus. So think about your friends. What do you do with your friends? I just got to spend some time with my friends, and we ate a lot of chips and food that was bad for us. We shouldn't have. But do you play? What else do you do? Go to their house maybe for play dates. You tell, tell them things that are important to you. What do you do with your friends? Pray with them. Jesus knows all about us as our friends, and he wants us to get to know him better. How do you think we get to know Jesus better? What do you think we can do? What do you think, Ada? We can pray. And we can read God's story, right? I think it's so just like God that a lot of our New Testament part of God's story, the Bible, was written by somebody that God asked to write these letters and that person was named Saul. He didn't even like Jesus. But God asked Saul to, to write this, these stories. And Saul had actually went around looking for people. And he would say, you like Jesus? Do you? He was looking for people. And when they said yes, he was looking for people to, that liked Jesus to put them in jail or to hurt them. Because Saul had never met Jesus. He didn't know Jesus. But one day, when Saul was on his way to Damascus, traveling around looking for people to put in jail, Jesus met Saul. And Jesus stopped Saul right there in the road. And with that one meeting, Saul's life changed, his heart changed. Meeting Jesus changed him forever. He even changed his name to Paul. He still kept traveling around. But now, when he found somebody who said they didn't know Jesus... He taught them about Jesus. He traveled around teaching people about God's love through Jesus, about how if you know Jesus, he will change your life. A friendship with Jesus helps us to be more like Jesus, helps us to be to know God's love more. So we you and I can serve God just as boldly as Paul did. We can grow and be bold like Jesus because we know We're part of this old, old story, a story of God's love and faithfulness, a story that is not over. It's still being written with our friendship with Jesus. Will you pray with me? Dear Jesus, you are the best friend that we could ever have. Help us to ask you when we have questions. Help us to tell you when we mess up. Help us to trust you and serve you boldly. Thank you for being with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, your children are now dismissed for Children's Church. Please stand with us for our song of preparation as we sing uh, Christ is My Firm Foundation. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand, when everything around me is shaking, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus, cause he's never let me down, he's faithful through generations, so
you sing with me? Rain came and went away. Rain came and went blue, but my house was built on you. I'm safe with you. I'm gonna make it through. Rain. Satan. Good morning. Um, now let's hear um, the words of God. Uh, we're reading, I'm reading this morning from Acts 27, 23 through 26. Last night, an angel from God, to whom I belong and whom I worship, stood beside me. The angel said, don't be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. Indeed, God has also graciously given you everyone sailing with you. Be encouraged, men. I have faith in God that it will be exactly as he told me. However, we must run aground on some island. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Gabby, Daniel, Scott, everybody. Will you pray with me and for me? <clears throat> and now, Lord, sow the seed of thy word into our hearts and nurture it by thy grace that it might bring forth abundant fruit for the living of this day, for the living of this new year. For we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, this is the time of the year when many of us start wondering whether or not we're going to get much snow, right? I've already heard the conversations this, this past week. And by the way, if you came in the, the door there by the, just outside the narthex, you might have noticed there's a new receptacle beside the door. That was the brainchild of Mike Mason, our, our, our maintenance uh, person and it's for salt so in case we do get a lot of salt hopefully we can keep the ramps clear and the stairs clear and the parking lot because you know it's Tennessee you just never know regardless of what they're saying about tomorrow you just never know right we might get a lot of snow might get a little we might not get any at all and, you know, Daniel, I remember 
my first snow day as a student at Mount Juliet High School after having just moved from Aurora, Colorado. Actually, it wasn't a whole snow day. They dismissed us early because of snow. This was back when the high school was over on Mount Juliet Road. I walked outside. I looked around. I looked up in the sky. And then I saw it. One snowflake. And I thought, man, there's no way I'm going to get an education in this place. But anyway, you know what I discovered really literally years later is that you might have one snowflake in Mount Juliet, but back at Watertown, they could be having a blizzard, which is the same school district. It's a pretty big district, but you just never know. I Also, years later, I had to pick up my kids from the middle school during the middle of the day because the school officials couldn't decide whether or not to call a school a snow day. And it took us three hours to get home, five miles from the school, you know? So you just, just never know. The, these days, 21st century Tennessee, we have snow days. Apostle Paul, Mediterranean world, first century AD, they had what you might call shipwreck days, right? Our text is kind of in the middle of one. And I, I want to read our text once again, if I can, just to short, just to set the context for my message. Last night, an angel from the God to whom I belong and with whom I worship stood beside me. Let that sink in. Think about that, okay? Last night, an angel from the God to whom I belong and whom I worship stood beside me. Okay. The angel said, don't be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. Indeed, God has also graciously given you everyone sailing with you. Be encouraged, men. He's talking to the sailors on board. Be encouraged, men. I have faith in God that it will be exactly as he told me. However, comma, we must run aground on some island. Well, our current worship series is Fresh Start. Make the most of this new year. Paul knew a lot about fresh starts and all kinds of other kinds of starts. You know, as you, as you might remember, when we first meet Paul in the book of Acts, when he was known as Saul, named after the first king of Israel, he was kind, kind of a bad guy as far as the church was concerned, right? In fact, he was kind of, kind of a terrorist. Paul went out of his way to have those who believed in Jesus thrown in jail, left and right, thrown in prison. And you know what? You have to remember that prison in the ancient world wasn't a place where they put you to punish you like today. Prison in the ancient world was where they put you until they could decide how they're going to punish you whether they were going to torture you, which they often did, or whether they would just confiscate all of your property, which they also did, or put you to death, which they did, particularly if you were poor. It's interesting how some things don't change a lot. But Paul went out of his way to have Christians thrown in jail men and women, and of course, it was on his trip to Damascus, Syria, as, as April mentioned during the children's moment, it was during his trip to Damascus, Syria, to round up Christians and have them thrown in prison that he had his first real 
fresh start. Paul encountered the risen Christ and the one who would destroy the Christian faith and thank God that it was dead became its champion. Or at least one of its many great champions. From Acts 21 to our text today, which would cover a, a, a period of just over two years, Paul himself has been a prisoner. First, of the Jewish authorities, the Jewish officials, and then of the Roman government. Now, he landed in hot water with the Jewish authorities because Paul came to believe that Jesus was the end of all the hopes of Israel. Jesus was the fulfillment of all the law was intended to do. Jesus was the sacrifice to end, end, telos, end all sacrifices to provide salvation for all and all means all, all means all people. Male, female, rich, poor, free, slave, everybody. And that landed him in trouble with some Jewish officials. Now, the thing that landed him in trouble among the Romans, the Roman government, is that he got this wild idea that Jesus was Lord, which is a title for the Roman emperor. Paul gets this idea that Jesus is Lord and not Caesar. And you know, Rome could tolerate a lot of things. They could tolerate a lot of philosophies, a lot of religion, as long as it was understood that no one is more powerful than the Roman emperor. So Paul is on his ship to straighten all that out to stand before Caesar. And then, of course, there's dark skies, swirling water, shipwrecks, stubborn sea captains, stubborn sailors. But he really, really believes, really believes that it's important for him to stand before Caesar and give an account of what he believes. You know, if you've, if you've read through Acts much or through Paul's letters, it's easy to get the impression that he wasn't a particularly shy guy, right? And, and Paul was used to speaking to people in power, to governors, to officials, to, to kings. And so it's no surprise that he really believed like it was important for him to share his faith with those in power in Rome. But then here comes storms, imprisonment, getting lost in the, in the hills of Anatolia and all kinds of other struggles and challenges and obstacles. Ever been there? Ever, ever felt like there's something you wanted to do for the Lord? And it just seems like just as soon as you make that decision, and it doesn't have to be appearing before the most powerful person in the known world. It could just be make a decision to get back to church or to keep believing when it can be so hard to believe in this world. And then next thing you know, there's obstacle after obstacle. I, I heard it said once that sometimes it seems like in life, we're either entering a storm, in a storm, or coming out of a storm, which admittedly doesn't allow for much room in the sunshine, right? <laughs> in the sunshine. But, but I think Paul would have understood because Paul describes being shipwrecked three times over in Corinthians. So it's in the middle of all that kind of, all that struggle and challenges that Paul is visited by that angel who stands before him. And that had to be incredibly inspiring 
and encouraging. But did you notice it didn't mean that he was necessarily going to have a smooth voyage? Remember verse 26, it says, However, comma, we must run aground on some island. You think that was fun to be in a ship with 126 sailors and your ship hits the ground? That's not a metaphorical shipwreck. That's a real shipwreck with wooden planks tearing and seawater, you know, coming into your boat and, and blinding your eyes. And then not only that, not only did they shipwreck on that island, which turned out to be Malta, the island between Greece, or yeah, Greece and Italy near Capri, but you remember what happened after they were shipwrecked and they got on the shore and they started a fire so they could warm, warm themselves? Remember what happened? He got bit by a poisonous snake. And everybody thinks he's doomed. Everybody thinks he's going to die. But the angel said, Paul, don't be afraid. You're going to do what God has for you to do. I don't know about you, but when I hear that story, I kind of think, man, it'd be nice to have an angel like that. You know, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be nice to have an angel come and stand beside you and say, Craig, oh, buddy, I understand life's not easy. I understand you just tried to pastor a church through a pandemic standing in this sanctuary for over a year preaching to one little green light with nobody in here and then trying to gather everybody back i understand that's tough but i want you to know buddy don't be afraid you're gonna be okay and your church is gonna be okay i wouldn't rule that out at all i'd love for that kind of visitation wouldn't you wouldn't it be nice to have an angel come and stand by your side and say mark don't worry about it, man. You're going to make it, Daniel. You're going to be okay. But here's the good news. We have, we have spiritual resources Paul could not have even imagined having. In some ways, we're in a better spot than, than Paul. Think of Paul. He's living in the, in the Roman world with a handful of Christians, and he's declaring Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. You think that was easy? Look at all that we have. You know one thing we have that Paul didn't have? The New Testament. Paul didn't have the New Testament. True, he was writing about a third of it, but we have the New Testament to inspire us and to encourage us. Paul didn't have it. They wouldn't have a New Testament for a couple hundred years in the church. And we don't know what other letters he was able to read. Did he read Hebrews? Did he read the book of Revelation? Did he read First and Second Peter? Or Je we, we don't know. You know what else we have? We've got the book of Acts to encourage us. Paul didn't have the book of Acts. He was living the book of Acts, but it was written about him, but he didn't have the book of Acts. We have the creeds. We have 2,000 years of history of faithful Christians to inspire us. We have the martyrs, like the young man who was killed in Ecuador for sharing the gospel. We have martyrs to draw strength from creeds, we have great hymns. We have, you know what else Paul didn't have? He didn't have a sanctuary like this to worship in. We can come worship here any Sunday we choose to. Think Paul had that? Nope. He was lucky if he could find a cave, right, after they kicked him out of the synagogue. Think of all that we have, the, the hymns, the wonderful songs that we heard. Anybody find the, the hymns inspiring or contemporary Christian songs inspiring? There have been times in my life when I don't know what I would have done if it wasn't for some song that just gave me exactly what I needed. But you know, there's, there's one song I just want to touch on that, that I think is a great song, and it's just like everything else. You kind of have to take the bitter with the sweet, right? There's one song that I want to talk about that that is inspiring but has always puzzled me 
And we did not sing that song intentionally today. And here it is. It's called, maybe you'll remember it. It used to be in the hymnal. It's called, He Never Has Failed Me Yet. Anybody remember? He never has failed me yet. Okay, here, here's, it starts out, it starts out uh, really good. Let me see if I can find it. I will sing of God's mercy every day, every hour. He gives me power. Now that's inspiring, isn't it? I will sing of God's mercy every day, every hour. He gives me power. I will sing and give thanks to thee for all the dangers, toils, and snares that he has brought me out. Somebody say amen. I'll sing and give thanks for all the dangers, toils, and snares that he has brought me out. He is my God and I'll serve him no matter what the test. Trust and never doubt. Jesus will surely bring you out. He never failed me. Yet, I can never wonder, I can never figure out why they had to include that word yet. You know, it's unnecessary, isn't it? I don't know if they had to, the professor wanted a certain word count or they had to do it to make the song rhyme. But here's, but God is not going to fail us. Not now, not ever. I think we sang that earlier, right? We can do what God has for us to do. We might have a visitation from an angel. We might not. We might just have all the resources that that we've always been able to draw from. But we can do what God has for us to do. In this year of the fresh start, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. In 1990, a group of Christians who faced discrimination in Cuba for more than 30 decades met with then-President Fidel Castro. A lot of those Christian leaders were afraid and intimidated, understandably so, right? And they, and they held back, voicing their concerns. They kind of sugarcoated the, the trials that they were facing, except for one. Um, Reverend Joel Aho gave a clear account of things that were happening, and consequently, the Constitution of Cuba was amended to allow for religious freedom. And afterwards, um, Reverend Aho was, was elected as bishop, as a bishop in Cuba, and also continued to be a voice for the oppressed and the poor in Cuba. And um, it's possible that some of you from Bethlehem met Bishop Aho on our trip, mission trip to Cuba uh, some years back. I had a conversation with Dr. Yako after the service, uh, earlier, earlier service. You know, we may not be called to speak to a president or a king or a queen of a nation, but we can do what God has for us to do, too. You know, there's there's, there's the apostle Paul, there's Bishop Aho, there's Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., but then closer to home, there are people like Dorothy Rose, Anybody remember Dorothy Rose? Dorothy was a member of this congregation for 45 years. Joined in 1978. And after she couldn't attend in person anymore, she continued to read the bulletin, she continued to read the newsletter, and she continued to financially support the church and especially programs like Kathy's Backpack and Backpacks and Feed America First. And so my invitation today is that we will seek to be an encouragement to others like Dorothy, like Bishop Aho, like Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, and like the Apostle Paul. And notice in the song that we're about to sing, 
you'll never hear the word yet. <laughs> Inside joke. Okay, let's stand and sing. I almost picked that song that you had in the sermon, but I decided <laughs> not to. Um, please stand with us and sing Oceans. Let me walk the 
my word from the epistle, Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. Will you say those three words with me? With great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now, and forevermore. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thanks so much. I'll see you when I see you.